it's a pleasure for me to introduce sir roy anderson if simon was around uh, he has another meeting uh, but he'll be joining very soon he would have certainly done the honors but but i think i'm really delighted to have professor roy anderson join us today to give this talk i think most of you know him very very well so but even so i think it's it's a it's a good idea to introduce the amazing work he has done i certainly and most others who have done epidemiology have read his book along with bob may and all have been inspired by the work he has done so let me go ahead and and do a brief introduction uh, professor roy anderson uh, is a professor of infectious disease epidemiology in the school of public health faculty of medicine at the imperial college london and the director of the center of neglected tropical disease research as recent appointments include rector of imperial college london and the chief scientist at the ministry of defense uk his research interests are in interdisciplinary studies at the interface between medicine biology mathematics and computation sir roy has also served as a director of the welcome center for parasitic infections from 1989 to 1993 at the imperial college and as the director of the welcome center for epidemiology and infectious diseases from 1993 to 2000 at the university of oxford he is the author of over 450 scientific articles and has sat on numerous government and international agencies committees advising them on public health and disease control including the world health organization bill and melinda gates foundation and un aids from 1991 to 2000 he was a governor of the welcome trust he currently is the trustee of the natural history museum a member of the singapore national research foundation fellowship board a member of the international advisory committee of thailand national science and technology development agency and a member of the malaysian biotechnology advisory board he is honorary fellow of the institute of actuaries the royal college of pathologists the royal society of agriculture and the royal statistical society he is also an honorary member of the royal college of physicians sir roy was elected fellow of the royal society in 1986 a founding fellow of the academy of medical sciences in 1998 a foreign associate member of the institute of medicine at the us national academy of sciences in 1999 and a foreign member of the french academy of sciences in 2009 was knighted in 2006 queen's birthday honors please join me in welcoming sir roy anderson we are really delighted to have you here and look forward to your talk well thank you very much indeed um it's a, a pleasure to to be with you today what i'm going to do is uh, quickly go through some slides part of it's to do with what the future might hold but i'm going to spend most of the time on vaccination and what our target will be for covid-19 and throughout much of this uh, mathematics and computation and data acquisition uh, is a key component of the work let me start by just saying uh, this is what happened in january both uh, in the united states and uh, indeed in western europe uh, mathematical models of um, viral transmission plus sort of interventions which were basically social distancing And these models range from simple deterministic differential equation ones to fully stochastic individual based uh, simulations and essentially governments were told um that there were no good options here with no therapeutic interventions no vaccine that they couldn't both minimize deaths from coronavirus and the economic impact of virus spread the two were in conflict so if you were aiming at the beginning of the epidemic to keep mortality as low as possible um which obviously is the highest priority for individuals governments must put in place measures to ameliorate the economic downturn so those messages were then sent very strongly to government through who and a variety of other organizations and of course different governments decided to do different things because many felt that what must be some sort of compromise between these two options but in fact there aren't you either do one very well or the other very well but you can't do both very well now just to remind us um human evolution our own species we're relatively new on this planet we've had um, some 300,000 years here 
And in terms of generations, which is the time from birth to when a female offspring gives birth to herself, um, we've had a few tens of thousands of generations on the earth. Now just compare that evolutionary time frame with a virus, which has in the human host a, a generation time, perhaps of um, a few minutes to a few hours in cells. They've had trillions of generations for evolution, while we've had a few tens of thousands of generations. So always the virus is going to be well, well ahead of us evolutionary. And that when I come to vaccines at the end, that's a very important point because this virus is constantly changing over time. So that's the first point to bear in mind. They, the viruses, are on an evolutionary time scale which is infinitely faster than ours. The second point to remember is that um, most of our infections are acquired from either wildlife or livestock. And if we take recent history, HIV, BSC, CGD, Ebola, influenza A, and the two SARS coronaviruses all have been acquired from wildlife. So here's a very important lesson that these events are likely to become more frequent in the future as we encroach more and more on the habitats that wildlife live in. The third point is that world population growth is going to 9 billion. Population growth is important for pathogens for two reasons. One, the more dense the population, the faster the rate of spread. Secondly, even more importantly is the more transmission events, the more opportunities for evolution of the virus. So those two things are hugely important. In our modern societies too, we've changed a lot in four generations. So this is a slide from geography and it shows four generations of the same uh, family. One, the great grandfather walked and went by horse and cart between villages. The grandfather went between districts, probably by horse. The father was the Second World War generation, and he you can see the imprint of the Second World War and his uh, movements. And the son is my generation, and I'm a globetrotter, and my children are even worse. Um, they globetrot all over the place. So in a sense, in four to five generations, we've turned from a local species to one that traverses the earth. And that has an important consequence for the spread of viral infections. The last thing is illustrated here is, of course, in modern world, each yellow dot is an aeroplane as a database that contains through time the number of passengers on each aeroplane. The dark shadow is the 24 hour clock. So it's becoming nighttime in the United States. It's daytime over in China and clearly in its daytime in Europe at the moment. Um, so you can see the intensity of movement of people between major cities. And we have accurate data records of the numbers that are moving through cities um, at any given year and time. And then lastly, um, mega cities, which are the number of cities over 10 million people have been growing very dramatically in recent years. So if we take Asia from 70 to 2015, we're going from two mega cities to 19 and Asia has gone much, much further more recently. Europe, Japan and North America are roughly static. So these huge conglomerates of people and the photograph is Hong Kong. And there we have, of course, evolution because you bring in wildlife and indeed domestic animals in close contact with humans. And this creates the opportunity for transmission. Now let's just look at um, what is unusual about this particular um, virus, COVID-19 and influenza A and the SARS um, virus, which was the 2003 one in Southeast Asia. The properties are a little bit different, but some of them matter hugely. First of all, there are asymptomatic infections with this SARS uh, COVID-19 virus. And these asymptomatics can be as high as 70% in certain age groups. So it means you don't have knowledge. You can't diagnostically identify them and isolate them. That was not the case with SARS in 2003. All those infected had clear symptoms of infection. The second major difference was more to do with comparing influenza A with the current virus. In influenza A, you have one to day, two days incubation. Then you start to get symptomatic about half a day to one day in. And then you have an infectious period that's three to four days. With this COVID-19, you have an incubation period of about three to five days. Two of those days where you're asymptomatic, if you're going to develop symptoms, you're infectious to others. 
And then you have this relatively long infectious period if you're symptomatic of about 10 to 14 days. And these differences, the fraction of asymptomatics who are infectiousness and the long infectiousness period, plus the period before symptoms occur, make this a highly transmissible virus. And of course, its average case fatality rate in the absence of medical interventions, particularly steroids, is around 0.5 to 1%. So it's a highly pathogenic virus. Now let's just turn to comparisons. If we look back to the 2003 SARS epidemic, the pattern of age-related case fatalities is roughly similar. The older the are, you are, the more likely you are to have a serious disease and a high case fatality rate. This uh, 2003 SARS coronavirus, number one, was more pathogenic than the current one, but it wasn't as infectious. So in other words, it didn't spread very rapidly. And you had symptoms of infection, like elevated temperature, well before you started to be highly infectious to other people. And that little difference, clinical epidemiological difference, makes a huge effect. Now, if we turn to the mathematics of epidemics, this is summarized schematically here. First of all, you have a stochastic beginning, a lot of noise. Then you have an epidemic curve, and the epidemic curve is determined by two parameters. What's called the basic reproductive number, R sub zero, which is the average number of secondary cases generated by one primary case in a susceptible population. And the second uh, quantity is the generation time, which is the average time from when you get infected to when on average you transmit it on to other people. And the bottom axis, the time scale is determined largely by that generation time. R0 determines the area under the epidemic curve and the generation time determines largely the time scale on the bottom axis. Now, it may seem counterintuitive that in a very complex host like humans with all our different behaviors, that two parameters dominate the shape of the epidemic, but they do, absolutely. There are subtleties and complexities, but those two parameters determine this rough shape of the epidemic. Then when the reproductive number falls below one due to people having recovered and acquired immunity or mass vaccination, the epidemic decays and then will bounce back as susceptibles are replaced by new births. This virus is going to become endemic. I'm certain of that. It will be boom and bust in the absence of mass vaccination, influenced by season as influenza A is. In the winter months where we're more enclosed, then the epidemic will have a higher R0 number. In the summer months where we're more dispersed with a lot of windows open, etc., the virus transmission rate will be low. But there'll be one major difference with influenza A. Influenza A during the summer months has an R value less than one. It cannot sustain. This virus, whether in the summer or the winter, has an R value which is much bigger than one in the absence of social intervention. So it's a very transmissible and it's going to be endemic with us. Now, what was done early on for governments was to say, if you do nothing, what does the epidemic look like? And these are mathematical models from simple to complex. If you intervene at a certain time in the UK and America, for example, right at the beginning, post introduction from either Europe or China, the doubling time of the epidemic was about four to seven days. And that gives you an estimate of the R number and the generation time. And this was pointed out to government that if, if you intervened early, you could dramatically alter the shape of that epidemic curve, stop the hospital system, the tertiary care being saturated. But to do that, you had to impose draconian social distancing measures. And the example, of course, was China, who did it to an extent that in our societies would be very, very difficult to do. They also um, pointed out these models early on to governments um, governments believe them to differing degrees, to be frank. Um, so our own government got the message, but then delayed imposing strict social distancing for too long, perhaps two to three weeks too long. And therefore, we had a very major first wave of the epidemic with a lot of mortality. I won't comment on what has happened in the United States, because you're all 
well aware of what's happened. And of course, social distancing has been very patchy across different uh, states in America. You've had a first, a second, and you're in a third wave at the moment. Uh, the second wave was more created by um, seasonality issues, and the third wave looks very, very serious indeed. Then it was also pointed out to governments through these models that if you relaxed the measures, and as we did in the UK during the summer months, starting in uh, late July, then the risk of resurgence was almost inevitable. It was probability one. And the blue curve shows that, that that is an example. And this was all published in the peer review literature, etc. Now, what you observe is, first of all, these sorts of models are in software. They're on websites from simple to complex. Here's one example from Imperial College in collaboration with BioNano, which is a company that makes um, or produces web accessible software. And this can be uh, constructed for for a whole variety of different countries. Um, these are simple models. They're not fully individual-based stochastic models, but the software is open access for those who wish to use it. It's just one example. Now, the reproductive number of this beast is about 2.5 to 4.8, depending on the country. And I'll come back to why that's hugely important later on with vaccination. The magnitude of that number determines what is the degree of herd immunity you'd have to create to stop transmission by mass vaccination. It's much lower than something like mumps and measles, um, which we control by mass vaccination, but with very high levels of uptake, often 95% plus in some countries. Um, it's higher than smallpox, which was eradicated by very effective contact tracing um, some years ago now in the 1950s. And so essentially, um, this number is not dissimilar. Influenza A is very low. It's about 1.1 to 1.5. And in the summer months in the Western Hemisphere, it's less than one. And so it moves from Western, um, from Northern to Southern Hemisphere countries during the seasons. Now, if we take the estimates of R0, um, they started off very largely from uh, China and then Western Europe and then North America, the numbers are all dissimilar or uh, similar. There's a little bit of variance between settings, depending on city versus country settings, etc. Now, if we look internationally, what is going on? If you look at the total cumulative cases, the website run by John Hopkins is excellent. It provides a very good source of information for many governments. And you can see on the left-hand side that we've got the third wave and a really deep um, growth in the epidemic most recently, both in uh, North America and in Western Europe. And then if we look at the cumulative deaths, you observe something very important here. The death rate has plateaued, even though the epidemic is rising. And that's because the clinicians have learnt how to better cope with treating a seriously ill patients. And in particular, the use of corticosteroids have saved a lot of lives. They reduce the case fatality rate by at least uh, 33%. If we look across countries from the US on the top right to United Kingdom middle top row, down to China bottom right, you see extraordinary differences. What determines those patterns is two things. One, government action, and two, the response of people, individuals. And in this circumstance, government is responsible for providing messages. Individuals are responsible for complying to those messages. And these different patterns reflect both government in, in, uh, advice, but also probably more importantly, how people respond to that advice. And you know that very well in the different states in the United uh, States of America. Now, let me turn to the interventions and the data side of collection. What typifies most countries is poor data collection during the early phases of the epidemic. What has become more apparent recently is much better data collection. And I just want to turn to some of the most important aspects of this. First of all, the models predict what lockdown might do or social distancing might do. But these predictions are rather frail unless you've got good data to back up what people are doing. 
The best information that my own group have had and Imperial College uh, scientists in general and the UK is actually tracking people's mobile phones anonymously, of course. These Google movement pattern data tell you how well people are complying to social distancing or lockdown measures. So that's one source of data that's hugely important in seeing whether lockdown or social distancing in different forms and formats is having an impact on what people do. And that's real-time data that you can collect and analyze real-time off Google. Here's an example. These are illustration of lockdown in the UK after the first wave in March and the second wave in September. And what you can see from these patterns are that the first wave people adhered very well. In the second wave in September, people did not behave so well, did not comply so well. So this information tells you something which you can insert into the models, which then could project what the impact of these different social distancing measures are likely to be over the coming months. And very sadly in the UK, this last lockdown had much less impact than we'd hoped, and the virus is still spreading very extensively at the moment with perhaps 20,000 cases a day and something like 500 mortalities per day. The second data is contact tracing, and I want to give you a salutary tale here. This is choosing one day or one week, actually, um, in November in the UK, where we had 333, 900 new infections that week. Of those, the contact tracing system managed to identify 141,000 of them, roughly. They provided details about contacts, about 315,000 close contacts. These were identified. Of those, only about 190,000 were actually reached and so if you just assume they all comply with the message of social distancing and isolation, then of the total number of cases, you only reached about 18% of all the contacts. If you take a further data set, which is do people comply with the isolation? The answer is only half of them complied. So you then go down to 9% of the contacts complied with the contact tracing message to isolate. And it's obvious to all of us, if that's the only impact, 9% on the total number of contacts, you're never going to control the epidemic by contact tracing. And the general message is here, the data load is so high that in essence, you can only contact trace effectively when the case numbers are low at the beginning of a wave or indeed, let's hope, when mass vaccination takes hold. Where do people acquire infection? I won't spend a lot of time on this, but the, there are other ways of ca ca capturing information here. There are three, basically. One is contact tracing. The second is detailed household studies. And the third is molecular whole genome sequencing that gets you to who infects whom. All three methods are very important. They're best and most powerful put together. This is the UK. Where do people get infected? Largely in the household. And that's obvious. It makes intuitive sense. The more important question is, who seeds the household? Where do they get infected? And on the right-hand side, you see that the supermarket, shops, pubs and bars and restaurants and gym are the very dominant where places where people seed household infection. So most secondary cases are generated in the household, but the important bit in social distancing is to identify where people are acquiring infection to seed those households. Now that's the UK. If I do a comparative analysis, this is in press at the moment, and will be on the Royal Society website next week. If I do a comparative study, Germany, for example, is virtually identical to Britain. And the United States is very similar too through the CDC household studies. So there's some important messages there. Household is most important and it has relevance to Thanksgiving or Christmas because you're more likely to pass it on to the members of your household 
family, friends, etc. It also tells you something about the attack rate, the distribution of this quantity R, and it probably won't surprise you to learn the distribution is very skewed with a variance much bigger than the mean. Most people transmit on to a few, a few transmit on to many. If you don't include that heterogeneity into your model predictions, you will be widely off target. So you've got to capture that distributional property in populations. And that means stochastic models are really rather important in this context. Molecular epidemiology is the most powerful tool of all. Um, in the UK, hundreds of thousands of whole genomes have been sequenced for this virus. This is an example actually from Iceland showing that by contact tracing overlaid by whole genome sequencing of who infects whom, you can actually identify seeding of clusters very precisely. Now this hasn't been done in any country on scale and it requires resources and data base action to actually do it properly, but it's an extremely powerful technical way of understanding transmission. The evolution also is illustrated by this contact tracing whole genome sequence. And I want to make just two points on this, and they're on this slide. First in Europe, we had one strain which probably came via China, but very quickly it was replaced by a second strain which dominantly was in Western Europe. And that was an evolutionary event. And this strain just overtook the whole epidemic in the UK. This week, a new strain has been identified, N501Y, which has a bigger R0 than the old strain, apparently. It's very early days yet, and it's replacing the old strain. So we've already had three dominant strains in the UK. So this virus is constantly evolving and changing. The critical question is not genotype, it's phenotype. Do these changes matter? At the moment, this new strain, which I'm sure is in America too, this new strain seems to be more transmissible, has a bigger R number, but to date, there's no evidence to say phenotypically it will invalidate the efficacy of the current generation of vaccines. But what is important data-wise is that this sequence information has got to be collected week by week by week over the coming years to make sure that the vaccines are aligned with the dominant strain that's circulating just as we do for influenza A. I'm going to end just very quickly on the vaccine work. I've um, spoken long enough. First of all, with reinfection at the moment, the number of documented cases which can be verified are very, very small. I've listed them here. The detail's not important. It's just that Essentially, there are documented cases of reinfection, but typically there are extenuating circumstances such as immunosuppression in an individual patient. So to date, the evidence, and, but this again, constantly needs to be monitored that um, we have at least immunity for six to nine months if an individual has recovered from the first bout, except for a very, very, very small fraction of individuals. Now let's turn to the Real issue. Um, so the shot that rang across the world, this was the um, headline in The Economist on the 9th of November, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, 90% effectiveness. It was good as it get, and bodes well for other vaccines, and it was much better than many of us were expecting. Now, if we then just turn to what the economic impact of this epidemic has been, when you worry about the investment in vaccines, the IMF estimates that in October 2020, $28 trillion have been wiped off the global economy. So if you spend a few billion on research for vaccines, that's a trivia in relation to the $28 trillion already wiped off by October. Then we had another two shots in the arm. We had the Moderna and AstraZeneca vaccine. The Moderna one RNA vaccine, um, very good efficacy, 95%. The AstraZeneca one, an Oxford vaccine, a little bit more complicated to interpret because it depends on dosage somewhere between 70 to 90% efficacious. The key issues here are what will be valuable to bits of the world. The Moderna one can be maintained at minus 20 and the AstraZeneca can be retained in a fridge at two to eight degrees C. 
So there's obviously, even though it has lower efficacy at the moment, there are many advantages to that vaccine for many parts of the world where getting um, freezing facilities into the regions would be quite difficult. Now, let me just comment about vaccination. The history is extremely interesting. These are some pictures from the newspapers of the day when Jenner in 1796 first used variolation with cowpox to protect humans against smallpox. And if you look at the picture, picture on the right hand side, the newspapers portrayed this as a very dangerous activity where individuals would sprout cow-like appendages if they were vaccinated with cowpox. We still unfortunately have a lot of vaccine hesitancy in both uh, North America and Western Europe, and that may be a problem for all of us. We've got to remind ourselves that when medical historians look back to the last 80 years, vaccines are the success story in modern medicine. They've saved more lives than anything else, next to antibiotics and perhaps more recently statins. And here's an example from the UK, it's the measles immunization, the same pattern has emerged in the United States. We have little problems at the moment up to 2016 to 20 with vaccine hesitancy for these infections creating issues. Now let's look at the global market. The rich countries, Western countries, US, Europe and Japan, no problem. We've all got our orders in. We look at the middle income countries, China will probably provide a lot of vaccine then. We look at the low income countries, this organization Gavi and the UN will hopefully. Remember the unit for vaccination is not a country, it's the world to deal with this virus infection. Where the vaccine producing nations, they're dominantly in Western Europe and North America with China beginning to emerge in COVID-19. Vast tracts of the world do not have access to vaccine manufacturing. Bill Gates has made this point a number of times recently. So there's a desperate need to have more vaccine manufacturing capability to deal with COVID-19. Now, how can you create herd immunity by mass vaccination? What it is, is the fraction of the community that um, is vaccinated and is immune, and that fraction decreases the probability that somebody still susceptible acquires infection. And that is the nature of herd immunity. How others behave influences an individual's chance of getting infected. And to put it diagrammatically, when you vaccinate the green dots, you stop these stochastic chains of transmission from having a number greater than one, each primary case generating more one secondary case. So the blocking this transmission chain is what mass vaccination does. I should just add the complexities of mass vaccination also related not just simply to R0, but to its distribution. This is a technical issue and I mentioned it earlier the probability distribution of the number of secondary cases generated by one primary case is highly skewed with a variance much bigger than the mean, and that's important. Now, some back of the envelope calculations are possible here. If it's a perfect vaccine, then the fraction you've got to immunize to stop transmission is simply one minus one over R naught. If the vaccine has an efficacy of eta, then the fraction you've got to immunize is one minus one over R naught divided by eta. So take a numerical example, R naught of 2.5 in the United States, vaccine 90% efficacious. And so your proportion that you'd have to immunize would be 67% of the population if the vaccine gave long duration protection. But we know for coronaviruses, that's highly unlikely. These are the typical vaccine efficacies for measles, mumps, rubella, and SARS uh, coronavirus 2. If we now turn from this problem of a vaccine that protects for life, some mathematics is involved here and some computation because the calculation becomes a lot more subtle about how you vaccinate over time. I just want to say that you can do very complicated um, stochastic simulations of how vaccination, this is an illustration of an individual based stochastic model. It requires high end computation to run this. The red are infected people. This is a few, um, this is a year condensed into a few seconds. 
and the greens are recovered, immunized, and you can show a policymaker by introducing vaccine at certain time points, how it will influence the course of the epidemic. And these spatial simulations based on um, spatial kernels of people movement. The first work of this was done by Neil Ferguson at Imperial College and Brian Grenfell also at Princeton. Uh, but these models are really quite sophisticated and can be used to demonstrate to policymakers what interventions will have an impact. So let's look at the vaccine efficacy we know, duration of protection we don't know, uptake we don't know. Well, if you do the calculations, these are analytical approximations, then you can work out roughly what level of immunization you would have to achieve with a vaccine of a given duration of protection. And this is the closed uh, expression for the approximation. If you look at a surface and look at the left-hand side, on the vertical axis is the critical proportion you've got to vaccinate. Coming towards you is the duration of protection from one to three years. And going away from you is vaccine efficacy. And that's year one. This is 2021. And you can see that if the vaccine has a duration of protection of about one to 1 1.5 years, and vaccine efficacy is about 90%, you've got to catch about 90 plus percent of people to block transmission. You've got to get a vaccine uptake level of over 19%. Now that's in year one. When you go to equilibrium, which is you're vaccinating steadily year by year, then the numbers come down because they're just dealing with the new susceptibles coming into the population. Now, lastly, to end, who would you vaccinate first? Now that might appear a no-brainer in some ways because it's the elderly who are dying. But supposing you ask this question, is your objective to reduce mortality in the short term or is it to maximize the number of healthy years of life gained by vaccination? And that's a more subtle question because the older they are, even in the absence of COVID-19, the less years of healthy life left you have. So what is the optimization here? Well, that calculation can be done. You need the proportion of total deaths due to COVID in each age band. You need the life expectancy by an age band. This is the United Kingdom. And then you can look at the expected years of life lost due to COVID-19 by age class. And this calculation was published quite recently in The Lancet um, by my own group, um, particularly Carolyn Begvari, who did the, the background work to this. And you can see that the optimum benefit is got by vaccinating the 75 to 84 year olds first. However, the general point is that if you start over age 75 and capture from 75 plus, you will maximize healthy life gained. If I turn to the developing world, the resource poor settings, the equation is somewhat different. So the United Kingdom on the left, Kenya on the right. You need good case fatality rate data for both. And this is what happens. When you do the similar calculation, in Kenya of recorded deaths due to COVID, 41% are in the 60 years plus age group. While in the UK, they are nearly 85%. So what that tells you is the vaccination strategy for a resource poor setting or poorer setting, aged immunization should start much earlier. So you should be aiming actually here at the 40 plus age groups to maximize the years of life gained. Well, to conclude, the virus will become endemic. That's not in any doubt in my mind. Creating herd immunity is going to be challenging because of vaccine hesitancy. Heterogeneating population density and vaccine coverage is hugely important. And ideally, one should start mass vaccination in high density locations. I just want to turn to, instead of reading through the rest of these, to turn to the vaccine hesitancy problem. I, I do worry about this because in surveys, for example, in the United States and Western Europe, sometimes about 25 to 33% of the population say they're very doubtful they would take a vaccine. Now, in my view, it's very important that government messaging says to them, it's not just protecting you, you are protecting your family, 
your relatives, your friends, and people in the workplace. And that is the message that's got to be hammered home very, very fast and very clearly. And lastly, is there enough vaccine to deal with the world as a unit of vaccination? If you took the most optimistic view about manufacturing over 2021, then at least one third of the world's population would probably not be able to be vaccinated in 21. And you might be looking at the end of 22 or into 23 before you'd have enough manufacturing capability to cope with the world's population. So in other words, there will be issues about mandating vaccination, vaccination certificates from moving from country to country, and these are complicated things for governments to orchestrate. Thank you very much indeed for your attention and the opportunity to talk to you. And I'll stop there. Hey, thank you. And Roy, brilliant as always and com completely authoritative. In the calculations at the end as to which age groups it would be most efficient to vaccinate first, is, is that only taking into account the first order effects or does it take into account the likelihood that the individuals you're vaccinating might be spreaders, you know, for example, healthcare workers and things of that sort? Is that part of the calculation? That's a very good question, Simon. It doesn't. Um, it's crude demography and epidemiology because the question was obviously asked by government, where should we start? Now, my own view is you start with healthcare workers on the front line, number one. Number two, you then move to care homes for the elderly. Although you're not going to save huge numbers of healthy years of life in the care homes, it's something that I think ethically, because of the effects in the first wave of the epidemic, we must do, and I think politicians want to do. And then our government has decided then to vaccinate the over 80s first. Um, and again, I understand that totally, but actually that's not optimum you probably should vaccinate over 70s first because that gains you more healthy years of life lost. Now, it's you and me and too. Yeah, it's exactly. Uh, in the United States and, and Western Europe, um, we have enough vaccine to deal with ordered, to deal with probably the over 50s. So we hopefully be able to eliminate, and those with serious comorbidities as well. Um, my worry is, of course, the rest of the world. It's the resource poor settings. So Sharad's question is the numbers that Dr. Anderson quoted for contact tracing about identifying only one third of those infected. Were these based on manual tracing or through using digital technology? They were based on manual tracing. If we'd used a mobile phone application as used in South Korea in the early stages of the epidemic, it would still have had deep problems simply because the epidemic is just spreading, the virus is spreading too quickly. The number of contacts per unit of time that have to be actually documented, data recorded, somebody send them a text message. Now, your question is very good because could you automate all of that? And the answer must be yes, as South Korea has done. But do note that South Korea has run into problems just recently because instead of dealing very effectively as they did in the first wave, through their automated text messaging system, the vast number of cases that they're seeing at the moment has overwhelmed the system. So if the technology is to be automated, it's got to be able to cope with a huge demand um, in these big waves of infection. But it's a very important question. We should try and think of ways of automating more and more of this. And you shared, a good, you shared good information about Western vaccines and immunization needs but you described the problem as a global one. Can you comment on the efficacy and immunization rates of the Chinese and Russian vaccines? <laughs> right, I'm, here I'm gonna get myself into trouble. Um, the Russian vaccine, personally, I wouldn't touch with a barge pole until an awful lot more information comes out on it. Um, and the, the publication or the information that's been released is on very small numbers and one can't make a judgment about it. I, I'm more positive about the Chinese vaccine, I, I think, this will be very important for Africa. I'm a little bit hesitant about the information flow. Clearly what they need to do is publish this in the quality peer reviewed literature, the phase one and two, 
Phase one is safety. Phase two is efficacy in immunological markers. And phase three is full-blooded use in the community. Now, China at the moment can't do phase threes in China because their social distancing measures have been so stringent, they've chopped the epidemic dead. So they're doing it in a variety of other countries, in South America and some African countries. And I await that data. There are two companies in China producing vaccines, and one of them has a multinational Western partner for the adjuvants in the vaccine. So my guess is China will produce a highly efficacious quality vaccine, but I don't think Russia will. You mentioned at the beginning of this uh, amazing talk that uh, government had to choose between, paraphrase it, between lives and livelihoods, but they cannot have both. But it kind of gives the impression that they have chosen for livelihood. <laughs> I mean, do, do you really think that it's possible to have an ongoing economic activity if we did not impose any control on, on social distancing? I mean, with a epi raging epidemic, I mean, even now, you know, people are reacting by themselves. Companies make their own decisions, not even government's decision. You know, the epidemic caused mm. people to change their behavior. Yeah. No, it's a good question. Um, the reason it was put so bluntly at the beginning, the publication actually was a, in a, a technical mathematical journal, actually applied mathematics journal. It was published in 2007 by myself and a number of colleagues, uh, Deirdre Hollingsworth and a number of others. It was a technical paper showing of your what, what your objective should be in a pandemic. And we settled actually ultimately on what the British government did in fact focus on, which was you didn't want to swamp the tertiary care hospital settings. We were thinking more of influenza, but that has the same issues as uh, SARS coronavirus too. And what it showed is that um, you could do a set of calculations. If you knew the case fatality rate by age, you could do a set of calculation based on the number of tertiary care hospital beds, intensive care beds. And you could give government options about what did they wish to do. And of course, when you did give it to the policymakers in 2008, they said, oh, we want to do all of that. You know, we want to do all of it. Um, but you can't, well, the point one was making with the models was you can't do all of it. You've got to make decisions and choices. And the choices are getting, you know, in America, for example, you clearly in many states made the choice to go with the economy. Um, in the United Kingdom, the government more recently has been very heavily lobbied by members of parliament to go with the economy. And there's been a huge conflict in the arguments. Now, my own view probably reflects more my age, actually, than anything else. I mean, if I was a 25-year-old now and a 30-year-old, I probably would be less sympathetic with the mortality argument and more sympathetic with the economy and jobs. And my only slight regret in this for governments is that they didn't really vigorously pursue whether you could segment working places and societies with a different structure for the younger groups and the older. It relates a lot to the intergenerational structure of households and families. So we find in the UK, for example, in certain cultural settings, then you might have three intergenerational groups. So you have children, parents, and grandparents in the same household. Well, that's a recipe for disaster, obviously. So culturally and socially, it, it would vary country by country, but I think more thought needs to be given to if we had another event of this seriousness, assuming that the mass vaccination works okay, I, I didn't touch one slightly worrying issue about that, which is the evolution of the virus. But I think we need to give more thought how you structure the economy and the workplace in relation to age dependent case fatality rates. But it's a very important question. So I think a lot of the prevention and, and redu case reduction that we've managed to achieve so far in a lot of places been due to social distancing. But I think what isn't clear is how the social distancing measures that are in place should be eased as vaccination occurs. And also in places where they never implemented social distancing policy or didn't have good personal 
you know, uptake of those behaviors, like what the recommendations are going to be, because I think the most tragic cases will be the people who get sick and die when there is a vaccine just on the horizon. Um, but, but there will be a lot of those actually. Yeah. It's a complicated issue really, because uh, policymakers, it, once they get used to models and prediction, they think that these models are sufficiently granular to answer very precise things like, do we close pubs or bars? Um, how, how important are restaurants and so on? And my argument always in this context is the models can, are not granular enough to give you the real details of human behavior unless you invest a huge amount in data collection. My comment about Google Maps and movement patterns is, is very relevant because it showed very clearly in the UK that the second lockdown and restricting inter-family interactions didn't work very well because people ignored it. They got, they got fed up with the epidemic and it was mainly the young, you know, the young meaning under 40, because they felt the personal risk was low. So governments have this terrible problem of, you know, the Christmas message and the Thanksgiving message is a very difficult one to put across. So I suppose the scientific point is that one has to be honest. Simon and I yesterday were at a, a memorial event for Bob May and Bob always used to say that you, you've got to be honest to policymakers. You've got to tell them the frailties. And here in the models, the frailties are they're often not granular enough to ask your question, number one. Number two, you need to collect better data. Great talk, uh, Roy. Uh, my question is, what could the scientific community have done differently, given what we know now? Could we have uh, collected better data? Could we have done something differently that would have, that would have helped us? It's a very good question, and I think a lot of us will be reflecting on that when we get through this mass vaccination one. So my priority at the moment would be, whether it's family, friends, colleagues, um, public talks, is to fully impress with people they've got to be vaccinated. Because by doing that, you're helping not just yourself, but your family, friends, work colleagues. If we go, what could have been done better? It, it's so variable country by country. Uh, South Korea did staggeringly well, put in place contact tracing of real quality, automated text messages by phone based on distance measures, GPS location of where one phone is, where another phone is. And it worked fantastically. Then people got bored. And this second wave in South Korea is quite major. So I don't think they could have done anything better because just people, you know, it's human behavior. You get really fed up with this and you have to assess a personal risk. On the vaccine side, I think the Western nations and, and indeed China did the right things. They pumped a lot of R&D money into quick vaccine development. I was never in doubt that a vaccine would come out here because what has happened over the last five to 10 years, as said very clearly by Monsef Saloui, is that the platform technologies for vaccine development have changed out of all recognition. So you can now do things quickly, technically. What I was less certain about is whether the regulatory authorities would catch up with that speed. And so I was a little bit worried that we'd have to go through the huge, long regulatory process, and that would delay the vaccine getting out there. So I think what we need to do in any interim in this epidemic to the next one is carefully look at the regulatory process in the case of emergency. Can we speed up vaccine development even more, given the wonderful technical platforms we've got. Then the question that somebody asked earlier, I think is important. How much of the data collection can we automate using sensors, modern technology, without impinging too much on people's personal liberties and information? And that, that's a complicated ethical question. South Korea could do it. We couldn't do it in the UK. We could do it anonymously for research purposes. We could get access to mobile phone GPS movement data, but we couldn't identify the individuals. So that's another thing that needs to be addressed. But a very good question. Thank you for the 
Fantastic talk. I have two questions, and you sort of touched on both already, answering the other people, but one is about ethnicity. So I'm here at the University of Hawaii, and we have a very diverse ethnic population, and, and they're affected in a very different way. So for the vaccination, I think it goes beyond the just age demographic, right? We have to try to address ethnicity at the same time, like the Pacific Islander form only 4% of our population, but they're 30% of our cases. And you touched also about those multi-generational. So it, it's delicate to put that into vaccination. Do you think there is, there'll be some global, like, uh, uh, I, I don't know, uh, uh, measures about that as well, or are we just going to stick with the age demographic because it's less controversial? I think um, at the moment, at this beginning stage, it will be very much related to the age and comorbidity issue. You know, whether somebody's got diabetes, lung disease or heart disease or whatever. But you're quite right. What is very interesting is as data, some quality data is beginning to emerge internationally on the case fatality rate, which is of those infected and symptomatic, what fraction go on to serious disease and die? there appear to be quite significant differences between different cultural and ethnic groups. And, you know, as always, genetics, we're all different genetically. Um, we know this very well. So if you uh, take volunteers for influenza A, usually medical students, and you ask them to be infected in a standardized group by age, uh, et cetera, et cetera, you find enormous variance in viremia between people. And it's largely because of their genetic background. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if the case fatality rate, independent of comorbidities, did vary by ethnic grouping. And I suppose ultimately that will be taken account of in the vaccination programme, but not in these early stages. I, I didn't go into the detail about what this new variant of the virus may imply, this group of viruses, coronaviruses, are RNA viruses. They have no proofreading mechanism of their daughters and sons, as it were. Well, we are a DNA organism. We have a proofreading mechanism, so we correct errors. So RNA viruses are a moving target constantly, and this virus is changing. Now, to date, there's no evidence that it's changing in the site that's important for the vaccine, but it would not surprise me if that happens in the future. And it would not surprise me at all if we're in the influenza domain where this vaccine will work for perhaps a year to two to three years, but then we have to change the vaccine construct because the virus has moved on. The more vaccination that occurs worldwide, the greater the selective pressure on that virus to change. And we've got to recognize that. The second question is about a major word roadblock, and I think everybody met that one, is the data, of course, and you touched to it. Uh, it's sometimes not just getting them, but we, we've, been, we've got a lot of pushback from the government uh, about the fact that we might model and predict or say something they don't want to hear. So that was also one of the issues. It's not just the privacy of the data, but what they can highlight, right? And, and they would not share them because they're scared of what we're going to say or what the numbers or the models are going to say. And it's very difficult to reconciliate this, I think. Well, the, the, there are, I mean, the, the ethnic issue is quite an important one because um, essentially there are some clear hints in the data already that there is genetic components to this case fatality rate. And that will, you know, that will eventually emerge in more detail. So I was curious about uh, what are the chances of the next pandemic, let's say in the next 10 years or so, would that be similar to this one if it were to come about or would it be different? Like, for example, drug resistant bacteria, for instance, and what type of efforts are underway to mitigate those problems if they were manifest? It's a, a question on a lot of people's minds. It, it, what, what's so ironic to me is when the World Health Organization did its pandemic preparedness analysis of countries, the two countries that came top, the United States of America and the United Kingdom, and yet we both behaved or performed rather badly. I think in response to you, 
other episodes are bound to occur. They're going to occur more frequently. It's largely because of our movement patterns as a species, our encroachment on natural habitats, population density growth, etc. The worst ones are undoubtedly like SARS coronavirus too, it's the respiratory transmitted ones. Particularly, we were told at the beginning that touch was very important. It, it wasn't so important. It, this is aerosol, micro aerosol transmitted dominantly. And so these are the worst viruses you can deal with. They're very, very difficult. But do remember HIV, when all this is hopefully under control by mass vaccination, HIV will still have caused more mortality than this virus. And that's a totally different one, different route of transmission. So we just have to expect that there will be more. We have to improve data capture in the early stages. We have to improve the Sentinel, global Sentinel capability. There clearly are some faults here with the origins of the virus, what happened there, the suppression of information um, for a short period of time. So we need to inc increase international surveillance. What you're looking for, and this is a, an interesting data problem, you're looking for unusual clusters in space and time of morbidity and mortality. And we need to generate a data capture system which will give us advance warning of these things. Ultimately, though, what it is, this is a truism, it's an obvious truism, is evolution is chance. Chance events play such a dominant role in the evolution of these organisms, particularly when they have no proofreading mechanism. And so it's very difficult to say it will be X or Y. What we can say is the respiratory transmitted aerosol virus with high case fatality rate is the worst option. And so we should be prepared for another one of these, essentially. And information capture, alert systems, the capability of platform technology developing vaccines very, very quickly, even more quickly than we've done this time. I was curious about your view about vaccinating school age children in light of the fact that they haven't been in the clinical trials and their match, you know, their different immune systems and, but that, well, in some cultures or that they do live in multi-generational households in some cases. I mean, yeah, just in I, general. yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, it, it's funny, but if you look at uh, trying to speed through these phase three trials, then, Essentially, you didn't cover all the bases in this in the very elderly or the very young for obvious reasons to try and get something through quickly. But the epidemiological information on the uh, course of infection in school children, young children, points to the fact that they're more typically asymptomatic and the case fatality rate is very, very low. So I don't worry about vaccinating them in a safety sense at all, provided you start at perhaps age two. You don't go younger than that. But what I do think is as we move through vaccinating the very vulnerable, then who infects whom, who seeds the household, then becomes more important. And it may be, uh, for example, in London at the moment, the schools are seeding a lot of households. And it may be one of the more effective ways when we got through those most vulnerable to stop this transmission is to look very carefully at the school educational settings and put them as a priority. But that won't happen probably until the end of 21, I would guess. But it's an important issue. Safety, I'm not worried about. It's whether you have bigger impacts on transmission that may be important. Thank you very much. Great talk. I actually have two questions, but they're related. So one is how to use tracing app data to calibrate agent-based models and maybe other reduced models. So if you have any suggestions on that, those models which resolve special temporal, well, I guess mainly special aspects and nuances. Right. Second question is if when we will be deciding on, well, uh, appropriate strategy uh, for vaccination, if we need to account for geographical in homogeneity, in particular within city, maybe targeting uh, a special, maybe maybe downtown, because those who live there they have much more contact with with the rest. Uh, 
uh, maybe some other correlations of that type. I wonder what do you think? Yeah. Good question. If you take the mixing matrices, if you take the deterministic models where you have um, sets of PDs structured by age and so on, you have to make assumptions about who mixes with whom. You then take that, there's a bit of analytical work on that, understanding how these mixing matrices affect the dynamics of transmission. You then go to the agent-based individual simulation stochastic models. You again have to incorporate how people mix in contact between age groups. Now, age has been looked at quite intensively, but that's only one confounding variable. I mean, there are many others here. The intergenerational structure of households is critical because that influences this age group mixing matrix. So it's culturally sensitive. There are other issues. These matrices could be constructed on the basis of the transport you use. They could be constructed, you know, as a behavioral issue. They could be constructed on the basis of where you work, what your workplace is like, what type of occupation you have. And to be brutally honest, we're in our infancy in including that sort of information into these individual stochastic models. And again, it comes back to data capture. Um, we need to understand there's some very good age-related data. We call them WAIF matrices, actually, in, in my own group, which is um, who acquires infection from whom by age. And there's very good international data there. But on the other confounding variables I was talking about, the information is very, very limited. Now, your comment about downtown, as it were, I was asked this question. I was giving a talk to an Indian audience recently, and one individual asked about Calcutta, Kolkata, and uh, Delhi. And I was thinking, if I wanted really to start mass vaccination, I'd start in the slum districts, actually. So uh, it's not just city. Um, you've got to choose your downtown area where people have the least isolation and the most close mixing. The markets, those serving in the markets, because these are often super spreading uh, type events. So it's a very important sociological question. But I think in the beginning of this mass vaccination program in the US and Western Europe, it's going to be a lot simpler than these subtleties. But it doesn't probably prevent us all in, in our sort of domain of trying to encourage the collection of data of what might be important. So uh, one thing I'm being asked a lot, I'm an epidemiologist, is really around how to, it's I think similar to, I think with Jill's comment earlier, but maybe writ, it, from a modeling framework, you know, how we manage expectations regarding our, our non-pharmaceutical approaches and interventions in the context of vaccine deployment. Meaning, you know, what are NPI thresholds that are needed? Uh, you know, we heard early on, I think back in even April, May discussion around, right? If, if X percent of individuals wore masks, we would see X percent reduction in, in uh, you know, transmission. So I'm wondering, I know obviously, again, much of this is very local in terms of the very specific behaviors, but let's take just our key NPI approaches, which you could argue are you know, distancing, masks, um, being outside. I mean, so it, just wondering your thoughts on that. Well, I think um, when we started off with this mask issue, both in the United Kingdom and the US, the Royal Society and the National Academy in the US, frantically uh, commissioned reviews on did face masks work? And there was a, a, a paucity of information and B, there was the feeling that wash your hands all the time. This was surfaces contaminated. As information became better about exhaling micro droplets with virus in, then it became clear, even in the absence of a randomized controlled clinical trial of those who wear masks and those who don't, who have similar occupations, the same ages and so on, even in the absence of that data, my own view is, is simply this is, again, a no-brainer. Wearing a mask helps, provided it captures the micro droplets. So, and I think in, I, I'm so struck in London that when I walk down a busy street, I'm probably in 20% of people are wearing masks. The other 80% are not. And I think that's incorrect. And I think in the States, you have a similar issue that in many locations, people don't regard them, but it's obvious. Now, how do we demonstrate these non-pharmaceutical inventions? Uh, 
coming more from you know faculty of medicine we're in the gold standard of randomized controlled clinical trials but in an emergency like this i think you you've got to quickly do a literature review and then you've got to use a judgment really sometimes it's a guess and many countries those pattern variation that i showed earlier between countries most of that is of course in part government but at most of it is actually people's behavior we've all behaved in different countries very differently in relation to the signals and messages we've been given. Some countries, of course, haven't given the right messages. I, I think in particular Brazil. But I mean, you know, in a sense, we ourselves in these events are more responsible than government, provided government gives us the right messages. But a good question. You know, one of the things that has happened during this pandemic is the co-occurrence of several natural disasters. and you know people are faced many communities are faced with the decision of whether they should shelter in place and you know social distance or possibly you know, evacuate and move perhaps to a shelter where you know social distancing may be hard and other facilities that are associated with preventing the spread is hard have there been studies of this kind and these you know these kinds of events will continue to happen natural disasters fires floods hurricanes uh, are there efforts or studies that have shown whether such uh, events have contributed to increased spread if for this virus um, at the moment no but if, if you look back in history um, if you take famine war and so on where you have refugee camps these tend to be major sites for the transmission of directly transmitted viruses and bacteria cholera blah 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 Mm-hmm. um i just had a report actually this week from one of the refugee camps um through a colleague uh, which is in across in sudan from tigray the ethiopian conflict and it looks as though covid has spread a little bit in one of those camps so inevitably if you cluster people together in hardship and sharing tents and sharing eating facilities you're going to trigger a lot of transmission you really are that's um inevitable i think i i have a you know in a sense the social distancing messages are, are difficult to put across i mentioned india and some of the slum areas of major cities and i also think of united states too if you look at the homeless you know groups of people sleeping under bridges and the same in london we have the same situation these are transmission sites they really are so we all have a responsibility to make sure those less privileged do get access to these vaccines but it's a good question thank you so much narini simon you have the last question and then we'll... yes roy with the multiple vaccines that are going to be out there do these target different parts of the virus and if so will that reduce the selective pressure and yeah. the the problem of select you talked about less of a problem I sadly actually Simon as far as we understand at the moment it, it is a commercial secret exactly what the actual target is we know it's the spike protein which is the yeah. protein that the virus uses to gain entry to the cell and unfortunately this particular receptor site is common to many cells in the body and that's why um, this virus causes damages all over the place you know from the kidneys to the liver to the gut and so on Now we know that all these vaccines are targeting that receptor protein site the spike protein. We don't know precisely though of you know this protein has multiple epitopes you know which are sort of jagged three-dimensional lumps where you know, an antibody attacks. And we don't know. My guess is that um there will be a little bit of heterogeneity and that probably is a good thing. I one of the mutations in this new variant I mentioned N501Y is bang in that protein gene. And what one doesn't know today and it's a frantic effort to try and find out um whether that influences the efficacy of the antibody target and the antibody latching onto it. So I mean the lesson at the moment let's assume I I'm typically an optimist let's assume it's not critically important in the three dimensional shape but what it does say is we've got to constantly survey this virus for its evolutionary changes and we've got to get the industry uh to be very reactive 
as we are in influenza A, season by season, to modifying the vaccine in advance of a new strain spreading widely. But it's a critical area. The recent work, which you'll be very well, familiar with, is the artificial intelligence methodologies that were announced last week, which enabled you to take a sequence string and convert it into a three-dimensional structure they will be very important in this area. And in fact, the London Mathematical Institute that you're involved in has connections with some of that work. Thank you. Thank you again for a terrific uh, talk. Thank you so much, Roy. We want to thank you. We realize you're busy, but uh, it's just very kind of you to spend so much time with us. But we'll be in touch and hopefully we'll get another chance to listen to this absolutely magnificent talk that you gave us. Thank, thank you. It's a pleasure. And a lot of very interesting questions, very pertinent ones. So thank you very much indeed. And uh, happy Christmas to everybody as well. If we can have a happy Christmas without uh, hugging too many of our relatives. Yes.